Um, thank you, Victor. And thank you, Mohamed, for inviting us or for inviting Tom. I think we might have invited me um, along, but uh, thanks for letting us uh, present our project. What we'll do today is we'll present some reflections on the nature and use of big data in a big interdisciplinary project. Um, this project is the, um, pro the Commune project. It's funded by the INR. It's led by Thomas, by Isabel Segui and myself. And um, you couldn't have done better really um, as organizer in placing us uh, or in organizing the sequence of papers for this conference because Lee opened um, the conference and we're closing it. And our project is clearly a child or a sibling of the British project. And what um, CAMPOP has done in sort of decades long production of the English and Welsh data infrastructure is very closely related to what we're trying to do, uh, which is both inspiring us and guiding us. Um, so there's an interesting parallel in the two projects and seeing how starting from scratch to a certain extent um, a bit later on uh, changes the way in which some of the things we do um, um, over time. Okay, so what we're going to do today is uh, very simply try to offer the sort of a set of general reflection on the nature and production of big data in the context of this experience. Um, the first point um, in that we're going to with what we're going to start with is really to think about how we construct the data and really thinking about a bit of the sources that we use or at least present you the sources. We won't have time to really go into the details, but obviously any question uh, later, we can answer later. The project has really two major components. The first one is the historical administrative units. And the second one are the transport networks that lease those units. And so we will briefly present how we construct those two um, to start with. The, the project, so the administrative side of the project, um, emerged from two existing data sets. The first one was the administrative history of uh, all French communes since 1801. Um, sometimes some people refer to it as the HAC data set or HAC data set, was created by Isabelle Segui, by Claude Mott and Christine Terre. And the second one is a sort of an enhanced version of that, uh, enriched with uh, data for the revolutionary period and linked to some points on the Cassini maps and the modern administrative units. And that's um, gave birth to the Cassini website that everyone uh, probably knows about or anyone who's interested in French history knows about. None of these obviously have GIS boundaries linked to municipal units. And that's really where our project started. Um, what we wanted to see is to be able to represent in space every one of those units uh, in obviously and see exactly uh, where any of them were in, in a different um, uh, point in time. The second problem with those data is that they really see uh, the history of communes from Paris. What we also have that uh, unfortunately I didn't put on that slide is Victor's, um, your work, Victor, obviously on the Third Republic, which is a first step, obviously, in the territorization or the mapping or, the, or making it possible to map uh, different administrative units uh, in the past. So all this together, it leads to what we call the Aina Commune uh, data set. And what we are now doing is we're completing those data with uh, archives collected from 95 department archives in France, each time collecting textual and cartographic evidence in order to complete and uh, those data and reconstruct the boundaries. So these, this is really very much uh, the structure, the very simplified structure of the data set. It's certainly not a UML, uh, complex UML uh, um, you know, scheme that you could see here, but at least it makes it clear what it is. And the, why is it, how is it done? Well, we have over 40,000 communes um, you know, between after 18 or 1800. 20% uh, of these change, so we have a, roughly over 8,000 8, changes to documents since 1801. We have a few thousand more in the, in the revolutionary period, but this we don't even know how, um, how many. We were supposed to be in the archives all this year, but obviously with the pandemic, we had to revise our plan. So uh, we will figure out the numbers soon, but not yet. So what do we do? Well, for, the, for when communes were simply um, divided, we can use the modern uh, quasi-metric precision of the data from the IGN to recreate past boundaries, and we have excellent accuracies. In the cases of commune merging, obviously we need to find the cartographic evidence of the past boundary of the commune, and that's where it gets more tricky. For the post-Second um, World War period, we can use uh, scans of IGN maps, uh, and our partnership with the IGN make this possible, so we just have to obtain the right map and just redraw the boundaries. For the 19th century uh, and the second, especially the second part of the 19th century, we have military maps that we can obtain in the same way. 
for the earlier period, uh, we have to rely on either cadastral maps or material collected from the archives. And, you know, this is what it looks like. We have a map uh, and we simply georeference it and redraw the boundaries. In most cases, the, the accuracy is quite good and we always measure it for each, each one of our reconstruction, but not always because sometimes there is no map, but we only have a description of the confines of the commune or the boundaries uh, when a commune was set up and we have to work with this textual document in order to construct a boundary that obviously is not, we could not find any documentary evidence for exact its exact position. The, con the, the result is this. So here you have a commune in 2019 and you have the same commune 100 years earlier. So basically we have for every year uh, in the commune data set, a set of commune uh, which is related or linked to the polygon that represents its exact uh, space, its exact area at any time, at any point in time. And what's the benefit of this? To a certain extent, it has almost a sort of an antiquarian aspect, which is we want to have exact boundaries for each commune. Uh, yes, that's true. There's an element of we want this to be as correct as possible. But there's another element is that, as Lee mentioned in his uh, presentation, is that obviously by having a set of um, administrative units uh, at any point in the past, it means that we can link to that set of administrative units any data created with the units of that period, natively, if you want, without having to reconstruct to fiddle with the units in the data set, other than matching the names. So that's one thing. But more importantly, and that's also a point we made, is that it becomes possible to link any data through that interface to any other data. And that's, in, on, that's at a basic level. So, for example, it makes possible to relate to data sets that were that you know give a different data for each commune to some level. But also, it allows two different set possibility of connection. One in a diachronic way. So it makes possible the use of time series on those very large data sets because we don't have the problem of aggregating different units. We can spatialize the data so precisely that we can link data, data or census, for example, for different years and always be consistent in our use of, um, of administrative units. So we, have not that, we don't have that problem. But also it's possible in a synoptic way um, because we can relate data to any cell, to a data, to any other cell through the relationship between those points and units through the transport network that we are building. So that means that for each point in time, we can at the same time examine the set of relation between each point in space. And we can then temp add a temporal layer to this. We can see how those relations evolve through time. So I'll let Thomas now explain how we're building the transport network to give you an idea of what it looks like before we go back to some reflections and what that means in terms of the scale and the use of that data. So thank you, Alexis. Yes, the link is based on the connection of the municipality through the networks over the period studied. So this is the transportation in in the center of, uh, of my preoccupation. And then we are going to build a multimodal network from uh, 19,000 to uh, 20,020, including waterways, railways, and roads. Next, please, uh, Alexi. And um, uh, this multi source approach will be based on uh, existing data. We have the postal network, we have the Cassini network, and also the French railways developed in the past project. And then for the information that we need to be completely created, we are working on the waterways actually. Uh, we are uh, working uh, with the uh, literature and the Pebble website. This is the site, website of reference uh, in the waterways in France. And the next year will be dedicated to the digitalization of the roads from the military maps, and but also from the Michelin maps from the 1910 and 1930 series. So these sources will also be used to assign an average speed and we have already done this for the pedestrian trips, for the stagecoach, for the railway travel, and we'll still have not to, to make an assessment of speeds over time for cars, trucks, and navigation. And this uh, geographical database will be made up of different unimodal graphs for pedestrians, navigations, rail, and car. 
And then we will merge all these different uh, unimodal layers into a graph that we will now call the multigraph. And the goal uh, of this multigraph is to connect the different modes with each other for accessibility calculations for the wall period study. So this now is your time. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm sorry, I was already on wine, as you can see. So probably that's why I'm a bit slow. Um, the, so as you can see, we have, because of those two um, aspects of our project, we're collecting a really large amount of data. Um, that could be cartographic in order to find the boundaries. Uh, that could be textual in order to find um, elements, administrative element about the commune themselves. But obviously, that, that is also all those elements about the transport network that Tom had illustrated. So we very quickly encountered a problem is how to do this. Because given the scale of the collection that we wanted to um, you know, harness in that project, we really had to think about the best methodology for that purpose. And ideally, obviously, when we, we wanted to have to automatize everything, it was it, it sounded like the obvious way to do it. But obvious, but that's not that simple, because there is a cost to automatization uh, that um, can sometimes offset the gains uh, or even outstrip the gains um, um, that um, that they are also linked with automatization. So if we if we were presented here very simply. Uh, some sort of a, a diagram showing that relationship. I mean, doing it manually is obviously extraordinarily expensive and time consuming. Uh, and doing it automatically can be very quick. But the problem is that there's also a cost to validation that could be much higher. And if the data is poor, it could invalidate the entire use of the data and therefore that could be completely useless and therefore be very expensive too. So we are, we're a bit faced with that problem where using the existing data and, and linking it to what we have was you know very very efficient. Uh, doing it manually was uh, very inefficient, and doing it automatically was efficient, but not very secure. So we were really thinking about how we could do this, and um, I'm going to give two examples now in the next few minutes uh, of how we try to do this. I'll give first an example of the kind of data when I'm saying we were relating data to our commune, to our bound, to our administrative units. I'll give you some um, examples of what how we extract textual data to do this. And then we'll give you some example about geographic features in, in, in for the transport network. So the first thing <clears throat> um, I'll, I'm going to present here is really the, um, the consequence of a project uh, that I've been leading with some, uh, for a few years uh, with my colleagues here in Cambridge, Janos Tatopoulos and Oliver Dunn, to try to make the extraction of historical data, uh, of tabular historical data more efficient. That's a project we call Thoth for uh, clumsily transcribing historical object with tabular handwritten data. The point is that lots of the historical data comes in forms of table and those tables I mean, extracting the text from it, uh, even if they hadn't written, now is a, you know, is a process that computer scientists have cracked to a certain extent. It's not always perfect, everything, there's lots of caveats, but it's possible. The problem is that when it's in the, in the shape of a table, it requires not only understanding the text, but understanding the relationship between different bits of the text. And that in terms of computer science is actually more difficult. And I'm going to give you one example here, which I took from the draft military, lot uh, the draft military lottery. So in French, the liste de tirage, which show consistently between the 1830s and the First World War, uh, a list of around 420,000 men, age 20 each year being um, uh, listed uh, before uh, there was any decision on whether they would join in or not the army. So it is a, is a very exhaustive list. I mean, no one is, uh, the, you know, every, all the ones that are not going to serve are listed in, this, in these documents. And I'm not sure whether Lionel would call it a poor source, as he said, the census were a poor source. I mean, this one contains lots of different variables, name, place of birth, place of residence, place of residence of parents, uh, height, uh, and medical history, injuries, uh, whether the person knows to read, can read, can write. So I think I would qualify this as a rich source, but um, I, I wouldn't want to obsess, you know, uh, make anyone being upset with this. So the, we, we, we obviously are interested in extracting data from this source. And what we did for that, we did two things. First, we elaborate a process of segmentation of the data, and then we fit it into this, a process of text recognition. I'm going to be very quick to show you what it looks like, but if you have a document like this, we can start first by using some basic sort of extraction of line to try to recognize a basic structure. 
then we can annotate those pages. If you generally now we are around annotating 40 pages when for a regular table, then we ask a, a model of a convolutional neural network to try to detect, to use that data to detect cells. And we use those cells then uh, by repeating this operation lots of time and correcting itself to create tables which have all their own relationship. And we can extract those fields exactly as you would then work with an Excel spreadsheet. It's basically each box uh, has its own uh, coordinates. And within those box, then we can extract the text using uh, you know, techniques of uh, called HDR that already are in existence and uh, quite common. What we get at the end is data that is quite reliable. And here I'm showing, I'm not going to go through everything, but you could see if you look at the, at the end point, which is the corrected data, uh, the, that the, the accuracy rate is quite good. Obviously it's, it would be lower for the last names because they are more variety and then it can be really, really high for questions for like place, uh, for places, which are obviously uh, much more limited in terms of the number of places. So that's a way where we can create data. And obviously with the data we have, we can spatialize or we can project all that data immediately into the communes and the canton in which they were produced. So this becomes very easy because we have all that data that was produced with the INR commune. The second example I'm going to give you is when we want to use and have this problem of creating data from cartographic material. Let's imagine we want the roads which is what we want at the moment. And we want to work with those etat-major maps or these military maps. Well, extracting the roads as segments first is challenging, but also when you look at the map themselves, it has other layers of complexity. Those maps are tiles and generally they're not stitched together properly. So what we might use in terms of the continuity of segment might be broken. The colors vary quite a great deal. There are also lots of different types of line and it's very easy for a computer to confuse one with the other. So you see what I was saying before in terms of the relationship between automatization and manual um, acquisition of data and the cost and benefits uh, is something that is obviously needs to be thought carefully. So what are we doing for this? Well, we have adopted a sort of a, a progressive, we are adopting because obviously this is work uh, in progress and um, progressive approach to this. We started by doing some roads ourselves. So that's the, uh, the what you see in the bottom left corner and we are digitizing some roads. And then we harness the power of the crowd and we ask you know, lots of people to scale up our power and do it with us. And that's what we uh, did in you know, some selected crowds uh, sourced data acquisition. But then comes the point where we are asking whether we can use this in order to feed into a model of machine learning. And we found two ways to do it. First, a simple way where we are just using that data as annotation and uh, training um, um, different machine learning models on ne neural networks to do this. But also for us, and this is a big problem, is how to relate any segment that we've extracted from a set of map to a segment we've extracted from another set of map, because we are historians after all, and we're interested in understanding how those segments are related. And this is where that uh, black box you see Covadeo here works, where we have created a game or um, Claire Lages and Hannah Elgoch have created a game that we're using, which allows us to ask people to pair segments according to, uh, from two different sets of map. So that gives us a second set of annotation which allows us to use a temporal element, uh, a temporal element of the data set. So our data at the moment has two, two aspects. One, which is for any set of map, a series of segments we use as annotation, and then we can feed into a convolutional network to try to get better at extracting them. And the second one, which is a pairing mechanism, which we could use also as machine learning in the future in order to make those segments relate to each other. So we could also potentially create time series of transport networks in the same way we are thinking about administrative units. Obviously that has implication in terms of data and the size of the data. To you, Thomas. So we have a, a big geospatial data infrastructure, and uh, this infrastructure is composed of heterogeneous data that we can formalize in a space time tube. In the vertical line, you have uh, the space with the local to the global, and uh, you have the municipalities uh, and the European countries on the top of, uh, of this cube. And uh, for the horizontal lines, the time scale extends from one year to several seven centuries. And these space-time dimensions are determined by the nature of the sources. And uh, in the next uh, uh, slide, please. 
Thank you. Uh, the, the geospatial data infrastructure is composed, uh, sorry, <laughs> these uh, uh, three uh, axes makes it possible to define the three components of this data infrastructure. You have the data warehouse uh, for the primary sources. You have also the HGIS linked to the DBMS for the structure components. And uh, we will use the intensive uh, uh, computing for the calculation accessibility measures. And we will use also simulation, exploration, and visualization for the analytical network. So, this uh, uh, geospatial infrastructure is uh, a gateway to even bigger data. Actually, we have 50,000 special units and we can generate 2.5 billion of pairs. Soon, with a multimodal, multimodal graph, sorry, uh, we will have 16 different possibilities and uh, four, 40 billion of pairs uh, will be generated. And next, then uh, for each year between uh, 70, uh, 60 to uh, 19, we will have six trillions of pairs that will be generated with uh, our infrastructure. And at the end of the project, we will combine all these measures with economic and demographic data. And uh, it represents, of course, a lot of data. And in the future, to the URI identifier, it also becomes integrated to any other type of linked data, for example, Wikipedia, uh, Wikidata, sorry, and the historical gets it here. So we should reach the critical size of the big data with uh, this uh, infrastructure. So with our uh, big data, it requires uh, an interdisciplinary uh, approach uh, based uh, on uh, this uh, different uh, discipline represented in this workshop, economy, history, geography, of course, but we need, of course, the, the help of a computer scientist to manage uh, this, uh, this lack of information. So we uh, need to uh, challenge three main domains. The first one is the, the data collection. We will need to uh, uh, add transportation data, uh, industrial and uh, social and agricultural services. We will need to uh, uh, add data processing with a high to performance computing, text mining, machine learning, and web semantic. And we will add it. So we will use the, the data analysis, for example, uh, clear metrics, or space-time econometry, or morphogenesis of, of network with, uh, with the computer scientist. So uh, this is the the kind of framework to add uh, data science applied to uh, the digital humanities that we would like to, to do at the end of the, of the project. So in the next uh, uh, slide, uh, we will talk about uh, the fair approach that we have developed uh, for the dissemination of uh, our data according to the data management plan. Our uh, data will be uh, findable with uh, data uh, metadata that will be uh, available in the Humanum infrastructure via Erist and uh, the cargo platforms. Our data will be also accessible. Primary sources will be accessible with uh, the warehouse data database Pandor, uh, which are developed uh, in the MSH of Dijon. And special database will be uh, probably uh, available with the Geo Orchestra platform. And uh, we are working with the University of Heidelberg to uh, develop a historical trip planner available in the open route services. Our data will be uh, interoperable. We design a, a conceptual model based on uh, UML and Alexi uh, will uh, illustrate uh, the case of, uh, of UK in, in the next uh, slides. And uh, our data will be also reusable. This is the case actually, we are sharing uh, our uh, uh, data sets actually with an uh, economist, for example, uh, uh, Christophe Lebec uh, in, uh, in Bordeaux, uh, historians and geographer in, in Paris, and also physician for uh, the morphogenesis of, of network that we are working with them. Alexis. <laughs> so you can see that what we have now is developed 
something that tell us about each spatial unit over more than two centuries give us a relationship between each one of those units in time, in space, and in time and space. But obviously, there are two elements that are perhaps missing in uh, the usefulness of that data. And this was a question Lee had when he presented um, the English project at the start. And I'm sure anyone who's not French or not a French historian here would have about this is okay, yeah, that's all very, jo that's jolly good. But what about how does that fit into international comparison? And I'll just add here a few um, um, remarks on the nature of the data and how this data can be made um, interoperable in an international context. And I'd share some um, element of something that uh, Lee already touched on when he was talking about occupational structure. And obviously, Lee said, the code that we use for occupational structure is called PST, or in international, they're called PSTI. And recently, we've been working on how to ex ex you know, move away from a strictly um, Anglo-centric approach to occupational coding to make that data uh, comparable over space. And this is something, obviously, which all the data that we are collecting in our common project it will be co coded in. So this will be also the backbone of our comparable socioeconomic data. So the current coding scheme for PSD, I'm not going to detail anything. Don't worry, Victor. But the idea is that we have a, there's a six point uh, <clears throat> um, coding scheme, which allows to distinguish between different occupation based on a series of uh, markers. I'm not going to explain any of this. What we want to do here is add new marker. So another eight, elements to that code, which would make it, I think it was Lionel who was making that point, this coding system context and time aware. So we'd be able to distinguish between two text strings that are exactly the same, but that means something different because they are from Northern France, Southern France, from a different period, et cetera. So that obviously increases the interoperability. But the problem is a coding scheme in itself remains a almost like a language uh, that you know, um, is only useful when you speak that language. And what is much more useful is having some kind of reciprocal relationship between languages that would allow those any language to be interpretable with another. And obviously economists do not use PSDI or some might, but it's not the most uh, um, common language. And Lee and I and others have been really thinking about how we could do and build uh, on this to develop a more, um, uh, a more sort of um, fluent uh, relationship between those different languages. So this started with PST uh, developed by um, Tony Wrigley here in Cambridge and uh, in its different versions. And in the project that Lee and Osamu Saito were um, leading uh, in CHOS on, lead, on making that code PSTI available for the occupational coding of more than 20 countries around the world. And this is partly linked to HISCO, which is a code that historians and sociologists have been using a lot, but it's not perhaps a perfect equivalence anyway because of the nature of the code. The problem is that if we want to have a new code, and I'm going to skip there, what we want to do is to be able to have coding schemes like ISCO, like ESCO, like all the national coding schemes, like the, all the industrial coding uh, schemes also uh, available uh, so that all of this could communicate. And so this is something that uh, we're thinking about and we will probably um, put in a grant application soon to, um, to develop more, where we would have an integrated code, which would allow also those elements to be translatable in different uh, languages or coding schemes. And so that shows also how in the production of big data and the production uh, in a national context, also need to think about the relationship of any of the nation, national data to other existing data, but also other existing data being produced in different countries of the same way so that they become interoperable and comparable. So I hope we've not been too long. I can't, I must say I've stopped um, looking at the time, but um, if you want to get in touch, uh, you can just do it at those links. And um, if you want to use data or if you have any question on data, please uh, just drop us an email. Uh, we'll be very happy to chat about it. Obviously, I'll answer any question that you might have.